Hello and welcome to this lecture about diag diagonalization. Um, difficult word and I'll stumble over it many times in this lecture. Um, but basically um, the idea of this um, section is to um, see, so in the examples we did in the previous section, uh, right, when we computed various powers of a square matrix, what we basically use there in order to do that is that we can uh, basically use, uh, have a change of basis given by the eigenvectors that uh, turns the matrix into a diagonal matrix. And um, that allowed us to kind of compute high, high powers, for example, of a matrix. And um, in gen this section here is sort of a general section about understanding um, under which conditions we can uh, diagonalize a matrix, okay? And so the first thing I want to start off with is a definition, okay? So basically, if I have a square matrix A, is diagonalizable, nice sort of longish medium-sized word, right, um, is diagonalizable um, if there exists an invertible matrix P of the same dimension, obviously, uh, because of what happens in a minute, um, so that if I basically use that matrix P as a change of basis, uh, then my P inverse A is a, is a diagonal matrix. So it's basically gonna be, we're gonna be able to write it like this, okay? So yes, the, um, the notation or the choice of lambda here for the diagonal um, elements seems to indicate that these are gonna be the eigenvalues and they will be, okay, but we're not quite there yet. So this is the idea um, of diagonalization and for short and also to save a little bit of space, I will write a, a diagonal matrix with these elements on the diagonal simply like that, okay? So we have um, this definition here and the main theorem for this section is the diagonalization theorem. And it basically, it gives me a necessary and sufficient condition for a matrix to be diagonalizable. Um, so basically, um, it says a matrix A, or let's do M by N again, a n by n matrix A is diagonalizable if and only if uh, A has n linearly independent eigenvectors, okay? And in fact, the matrix P uh, that we can use for the diagonalization of A will be the matrix that has those eigenvectors as column vectors. We'll see that in the proof in a minute, okay? And of course, right, if we have n linearly independent vectors, generally the matrix that contains those as column vectors will be invertible. That's all stuff we uh, already know. And uh, I do want to uh, do the proof of this theorem here. Don't wanna maybe make a textbook perfect in order to save some time and space. But um, the idea is we have to prove two directions because this is an if and only if statement. So the first direction would ba basically be um, we would have to prove there that if a matrix is diagonalizable, then it has n linearly independent eigenvectors. And so basically we start with right, this statement here. Okay, so if we have 
this equation holding here, then we have to basically show that we can get n eigenvectors that are linearly independent. And the whole idea really for this direction, but also for the other direction of this proof, is to simply observe, so if I call this diagonal matrix here D for the moment, uh, is to, to sort of observe that, right, this statement that I just wrote here, by basically multiplying both sides through by P, I can also write um, like this, okay? Um, but um, if we write P as given by its column vectors like this, then the original definition that we had of a matrix vector product uh, told us that I can write the left-hand side of this equation like this, right? I simply apply the matrix to the column vectors of P. And on the right-hand side, right there, we're basically taking this matrix here and multiplying it by that diagonal matrix. So we kind of have, right, mentally, this isn't completely correct. I, I already mentioned it's not a perfect perfect textbook uh, proof, right? But if you basically, right, look at the um, right-hand side PD, right, it would basically it, it'll look like this. But then I get as, right, by virtue of matrix matrix multiplication, um, I would get that the first column vector now is lambda 1, V1. The second column vector is lambda 2, V2, and so on. And now if we simply compare column vectors of this matrix uh, and this matrix, we basically get that all of the column vectors of P are eigenvectors, okay? So this means VI are eigenvectors. And of course, these are linearly independent because they're the column vectors of an invertible matrix, okay? So that is the one direction that we have to prove for that theorem. And the other direction really just um, uses sort of this observation here in this line sort of backwards, right? So if we have um, n linearly independent eigenvectors, we simply, so vi are n linearly independent eigenvectors, if we start with that, okay, then we simply uh, let P consist of the matrix that contains those eigenvectors as column vectors, because they're linearly independent, P is invertible, okay, so then P inverse exists, okay, and then we can see that we can use P for diagonalization really for, uh, for the same reason um, um, that is already on the board in this line here, okay? So the, the idea is that, right, uh, then if I look at P inverse AP, okay, then I can see that AP is this thing here, okay? But now, because these are eigenvectors, which we haven't really used at this point yet, I get P inverse times V1, lambda 2, V2, up to lambda and Vn. But now I can write um, this matrix here as PD, like what, what we've seen up here, 
So this is really P inverse PD by P inverse and P cancel. So we get that indeed this change of faces here gives us a diagonal matrix, okay, in that new basis. So this is the diagonalization theorem. And it is, again, a criterion for having, uh, for being able to diagonalize a matrix, okay? So if my, that criterion here isn't satisfied, then we don't have a chance. I do want to point out, right, we had a previous result that told us, right, if all eigenvalues are distinct, then um, the eigenvectors will be linearly independent. And so in that situation, we can also diagonalize the matrix. Okay, so that's um, most of the theory out of the way for this section. Just want to do a bunch of examples. Um, maybe I can uh, speed these up a little bit because this lecture promises to be long again. I don't know exactly how long. <laughs> you, you, of course, will have seen that already once uh, my, uh, you, that uh, video is done. Um, okay. So, uh, so these examples are sort of just there to demonstrate right, some aspects of this diagonalization theorem. So if we look at those, so this is kind of, I guess, the first example that I'm doing with uh, really calculating eigenvalues and eigenvectors um, for a three by three. Okay, so if we go through the usual process of finding eigenvalues, we basically have to calculate the determinant of a minus lambda i and set that, and set that equal to zero, which will give us the characteristic equation. So that means we're basically dealing with having to find, and I just want to check whether this matrix is correct um, to begin with. So basically we have to find The determinant of this three by three matrix, all right? And uh, maybe let's just work it out once in some detail, right? So the, um, I wouldn't recommend trying to row reduce this three by three matrix uh, simply because you have to drag the lambda through all of this, okay? Um, so I'd rather uh, prefer to kind of use the cofactor approach um, or whatever we call that the usual way from Cal3, uh, right? So if we use our first row to start calculating the determinant, then I basically get one minus lambda times this subdeterminant here. And then there's a minus three times this subdeterminant here. And then there's a plus three, which is that three here, times this two by two subdeterminant here. Okay. And if you work this out, okay, and this is maybe where I'm, you know, skipping a little bit uh, some steps, okay? Um, you'll get a cubic um, polynomial. Uh, simply, it really just comes from the first term, the cubic uh, part, and uh, you can kind of see that that cubic polynomial factors as one minus lambda times lambda plus two squared, okay? So you could ask, well, how do I know how to factor a cubic? Well, um, you can graph the cubic equation and see where the graph crosses the x-axis, okay? That would happen at one and negative two. Um, or you could just guess and check, right? Um, basically just plug in um, zero. <laughs> You'll see immediately that zero isn't a uh, solution, one and stuff like that. Uh, you might, the other right, factoring technique that you might remember is factoring by grouping, okay? That might work too in some situations. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure if it works here. Um, but this is sort of the algebra that I really don't want to spend too much time on. So the idea is maybe your best bet is just to like, factor, um, sorry, graph that 
uh, equation and see where you have the intercepts, okay, and, and check that, right, uh, these intercepts are actually solutions to the characteristic equation. But what I'm trying to say is uh, that we have two eigenvalues, one and negative two, okay, so we have lambda equals one with multiplicity one, and we have lambda equals negative two with multiplicity two, okay? So the um, result that I mentioned earlier about um, distinct eigenvalues, we can't use that in this case, right, because this lambda equals negative two occurs with multiplicity two, so these eigenvalues aren't distinct, okay? So we have to kind of go the long way to figure out uh, whether this matrix is diagonalizable. And the long way really involves just finding the eigenvectors, okay, and see whether they're linearly independent, okay? Um, so, if, so if I f find the eigenvec eigenvectors for lambda equals one, okay, then I have to look at A minus lambda i, that matrix here, where lambda equals one, and that matrix will look like this. Uh, it's actually easier to refer back to the matrix I had before, um, where we had the A minus lambda i in general, but So we get this matrix here, and we really need to find the, the A vector that spans the null space of it. And of course, the way we do this is to row reduce the matrix to find that vector, okay? So this will have to have a free variable, okay? Precisely one free variable. And then we can see that in a situation like this, you can almost just guess and check to see that uh, if we choose this vector here as an eigenvector, that'll work, okay? Simply because if you plug it in, right, you get zero here if you multiply that, this row vector by that really column vector and the same for the second line. So that's good. Um, I, in order to figure out whether the matrix is diagonalizable, I didn't really have to do that. Okay, but I do want to also find the matrix P that does diagonalize it, so um, that's why I did this. So if we look at the eigenvectors for lambda equals negative two, right, then again we have to look at the matrix, in this case, A plus A plus two I, and see whether it's null space is one or two dimensional, okay? So, um, so again, if you have sort of this pattern where, you, where it, it appears that, right, really, I mean, in this case, all color vectors are the same, uh, then, um, well, it's kind of good news because the row reduction is very simple to do by hand. So in this case, we get this row, uh, row reduced form of the matrix, okay? And that basically means we have two free variables, and that means at this point already, right, that this matrix is diagonalizable because we'll get two linearly independent eigenvectors out of this one, okay? So the idea is, again, right, to let, uh, right, so my x2 and x3 are free variables, and then I can express x1 as minus x2 minus x3. So that means if I basically write out the null space for this, I'm getting that um, an x in the null space would be x2 times negative 1, 1, 0, plus x3 times negative 0, 1, okay? 
So in other words, I can choose as my eigenvectors for lambda equals negative two, I can choose these two here, and these are uh, obviously by inspection, you can see linearly independent, but the, the theory also gives us that they're linearly independent because these correspond to different um, free variables, okay? So basically I can, so for lambda equals negative two, I get V1, well, I have kind of lost track here of my notation. Um, I get V1 equals is an eigenvector, and this one here is another linearly independent eigenvector. So basically, we, we can see that if we use as P this matrix here, so it was the first eigenvector that isn't on the board anymore, and these two here. Then this is again, you can check that in the end, but you don't really have to uh, write if you're sure that all these steps are correct. Then if I look at the matrix product P inverse AP, it becomes the diagonal matrix with the eigenvalues on the diagonal, okay? So this certainly is a, isn't a contradiction to the diagonalization theorem. It can't be because the, the diagonalization theorem, of course, is true, um, but it's a demonstration of kind of right um, what uh, we would kind of have in a particular example if we wanted to right, find a matrix that diagonalizes, in this case, that given matrix A. Okay, so that's my first example. Um, I want to do a second example and um, there, it's basically an example where that doesn't happen. So uh, the, the second example is very similar to the one we're doing in, in many ways, uh, at least initially. And I do want to skip some of the algebraic uh, steps here. So the idea is that we start with this three by three matrix here. And if you do the eigen, so the, uh, if you look at the characteristic polynomial or characteristic equation, um, we again, after some algebra that involves determinants, it, it will basically factor in the same way as in the previous example, right? That's certainly we can have different matrices with the same characteristic equation, and it sort of has to be that way because you're compressing a lot of information. So this is sort of a, a, an example that is that I chose, or maybe the book chose it, I don't know, don't want to take credit for it, uh, where we happen to have the same eigenvalues with the same multiplicities, okay? Um, but in this case, uh, for um, lambda equals negative two, things are different than before. So for lambda equals one, uh, that again gives me the same eigenvector that we had before. This is again right, an, an example that was engineered maybe to save some time, okay? If you actually think about what you just learned, you probably understand and know how you can engineer such examples uh, because you can start with a given set of eigenvalues and eigenvectors and then find a matrix <laughs> um, that has those, but that's not really the main thing for today. Um, or, yeah. Um, but for lambda equals negative two, and that's what, what's different about this example, is uh, we have something different. So if we look at the matrix A plus two I for that one, Okay. 
okay, which looks like this. If I roll reduce that, and you probably know where this is going now, we're gonna only have one free variable, okay? And that means um, we can't have three linearly independent eigenvectors in total, okay? So because right again, whatever is in the null space of this will be an eigenvector, and you can see that we only have one linearly independent eigenvector, which is going to be the vector, you can see that, um, a negative one, one, zero, okay? So in other words, um, the, this matrix here, so this basically tells us that A is not diagonalizable. Um, as I will kind of um, get into in a couple of minutes, we can sort of almost di diagonalize, diagonalize this matrix A by finding something called a generalized eigenvector. Um, but before I do that, I just want to check my slides here. Okay, so the next theorem, which I'll just, which I really already mentioned, um, is uh, says that uh, an n by n matrix with n distinct eigenvalues is diagonalizable. Just as a repetition, the reason why that works is because n distinct eigenvalues means uh, that the corresponding eigenvectors will be linearly independent, and then we can use the diagonalization theorem to see it's diagonalizable. Okay. Um, okay. And there's kind of a quick example for that on the slides, which I, I don't really want to uh, spend the time and the effort, uh, well, it's effort for me, <laughs> uh, um, to write this on the board. Um, so that, that example there, you simply have a, an upper triangular matrix, and there it's very easy to see what the eigen, um, values are, okay? And, um, the next example um, that maybe I should just uh, write on the board, there is a four by four, but it's an easy one. And I'm using this example to just introduce some terms uh, which are algebraic and geometric multiplicity. Um, I'm sort of, uh, that information, you can find that on, I think the two slides that I just skipped. I just want to kind of uh, um, address in this example what these things mean. They really don't, I guess, strictly speaking, add a whole lot of knowledge to what we had. So there's kind of definitions which uh, I might not have to had to go into. But here is basically the idea uh, of uh, this algebraic and geometric multiplicity using this uh, four by four here. So again, it's harmless as far as the eigenvalues is concerned, right? Because um, the eigenvalues, we had that before, will simply appear on the diagonal because in this case, it's a lower triangular matrix. So we basically have um, a really, I mean, let, let me actually back up one step here, right? We have a characteristic equation, okay? And again, you can simply write that out, right? Because if you subtract lambda off the diagonal, we know that the determinant of this upper triangular matrix will simply be um, the product along the diagonal. So our, our characteristic equation, right, we can, if we wanted to write it like this, of course you can um, make this a little bit nicer looking uh, without all these minus signs. Um, but right, the idea is that um, we, if we look at the two eigenvalues that we have, which are five and negative three, um, they both have multiplicity as far as the characteristic equation is concerned uh, of two. So that is what is their algebraic multiplicity of this 
is, uh, let me not get into the N and the M that I'm using in the slides. Um, so let me just use the words, okay? So both of these eigenvalues here have algebraic multiplicity two. Okay, that's simply because there are repeated zeros in the characteristic equation. And the idea is, or the next thing that I want to um, address is there's also something called a geometric multiplicity, okay? And so the geometric multiplicity is simply the dimension of the corresponding eigenspace, okay? So in other words, if I now basically uh, right, follow up on this observation and compute the eigenvectors corresponding to these eigenvalues here, if I have two linearly independent eigenvectors, my geometric multiplicity will also be two, okay? Um, but if I only had, like in the one example we just seen already, a sort of one-dimensional eigenspace only, then the geometric multiplicity of that um, eigenvalue would be one, right? So concretely, in this example here, what I would have to do to figure that out is I would have to look at a minus five i for lambda equals five, okay? So there, the matrix you can see is really just gonna give me zeros where we had fives. And negative eights where we had negative threes. Okay, so if you row reduce this, you get I'm trying to Actually, I guess I have to. If you row reduce this, you get two free variables, which means that in this, using this newfound term that we have, which means the geometric multiplicity is two, okay? So let me just write this out. So if you row reduce things, then you get this thing here. So you can see at this point, right, that um, the dimension of the eigenspace is two because we have two free, two free variables. If you specifically wanted to figure out the eigenvectors, then you would get these, or two, min I should say, two linearly independent eigenvectors because of course we know that they are not unique in any uh, shape or form. Okay, and right, because we have two of them, uh, we have, in this case, a geometric multiplicity. Of, that is equal to two as well, okay? So that's, again, right, has something, is defined via the dimension of the um, eigenspace. If we look at the other eigenvalue, negative three, we get this matrix here. Now where we had zeros, we have eights, and where we had those negative eights, we'll have zeros. And if you row reduce that matrix, okay, you will get this. And I'm not sure if we had anything like this before. Um, so what, what's the interpretation of this, right? You could say, well, I still have two free variables, but these two free variables won't give me linearly independent eigenvectors, right? I mean, yes, technically, maybe I should have not really um, expressed this in terms of free variables, but more in, in terms of the dimension of the eigenspace, um, right? The idea is that, oh no, wait, this one's fine too. 
Oh, all right. Okay. We have to we have to back. Uh, so everything I said was fine except the last thing uh, about. I think everything I said was fine. Um, so this one here also has two linearly independent eigenvectors. Okay, you can see that in this case they're simply unit vectors. Okay, I'm, I think I'm good um, with explaining this because I wanted to visit, revisit the, um, the previous example. So here the ge ge geometric multiplicity is also two, okay? And yes, all right. So I hope this was okay to follow um, so far. There's just one more example I want to do, and this is about generalized eigenvectors, and maybe I don't know how long I've, I've already uh, uh, been going on for this. Uh, if you need a break, just stop the video and take a break. Um, I, I won't. Um, okay, so, so here is basically um, one thing we want to know in addition to just eigenvectors, uh, okay? And this is about general generalized eigenvectors. I'm not sure if this is in the book, in the main part of the text. Um, I'm rather certain it's going to be, if it's not, it's going to be in some example. Um, but here's the idea. So if we revisit this three by three matrix that we had before, Okay. So there we basically saw that we have lambda equals um, one, okay? And this had algebraic and geometric multiplicity equal to one, okay? But then for the other eigenvector, uh, eigenvalue uh, negative two, we had algebraic multiplicity two because it uh, because it was a repeated zero in the characteristic equation. It sort of has to be because the characteristic equation has to be cubic, right? And it's not have two eigenvalues. One of them has to be a repeated zero, but the 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 geometric multiplicity. Okay, and this is sort of the example I was missing in the previous one. Uh, but it works now, uh, is only one, okay? So we have sort of a deficit in the geometric multiplicity, and so that again means we cannot diagonalize this matrix here. But we can almost diagonalize it using what is called a general eigen, generalized eigenvector as part of the basis, okay? And so the way this works, okay, um, is to... Um, basically look at, so for this one here, the corresponding eigenvector from before was, let's try to find this. The one we found before was this one here, okay? And here, the eigenvector that we found uh, or an eigenvector that we found was this one here. So this was uh, in the earlier part of this video. And so here's the idea. So um, the idea is if we want to find a generalized eigenvector, and I'll just give you the how to, okay? right now, okay, and then we can check later that that works, is to basically look at, so this would be generalized eigenvector W. So can we find a sort of second vector W that in some way corresponds to this lambda equals negative two? So if we use V, this V here and this W as part of our basis, we can change basis and get as close to a diagonal matrix as possible, all right? And so the idea is, that um, we can find this W uh, by solving this equation here, 
Okay, we basically solve a minus lambda i w equals v. All right. So this is um, right. If you want, fits in the um, context of what we did before, in the sense that right, if we find eigenvectors, not generalized eigenvectors. We basically solve a minus lambda i v equals zero, okay? But now we're basically taking that v that we found as the new right-hand side, and whatever we get here is our generalized eigenvector, okay? So if we want to do that, right, then I basically have to, right, in this case, look at a, in this case, a plus 2i, and use this vector v, this vector here, as the right-hand side. So if we use an augmented matrix for that, it'll look like this. So again, this is a plus 2i, okay? And that is the eigenvector that we found. And now if you wrong reduce this, and in effect really just solve the system, you get, I mean, the matrix part is gonna be exactly the same matrix part that we had before um, for a plus 2i, but the right-hand side is what we're interested in. And, ooh, in this case, it doesn't change at all, all right? But that's, okay, so maybe that's a bad example in that sense. Uh, in this case, it doesn't change at all. Um, I guess simply because I don't need to do really much, many row operations at all. Um, Yeah, I guess because if I add these two together, I get the last row, right? Uh, so I can just put that down there. And then if I effectively multiply this one here by negative um, three fourths and add it to this, I will in effect, yeah, get that. Okay, so again, in general, this is not gonna be that same V here. Okay, it just happens in this example here. But the point is, right, if we wanna find the, uh, right, the general solution for that system, then uh, what we can do is, right, we, uh, okay, we choose X2 uh, as a free variable, okay? Uh, X3, we can see from this equation here, obviously, right, um, it's gonna be, right, if you just put x2, put the equations back in, right, this will be, uh, sorry, the variables back in, x3 will be one from this line here, and then x1 is minus one minus x2. So what I'm basically getting is, right, that my w, I still have that free variable in there and we'll just choose it to be one in a minute, but basically my choices for W would be X2 So this one here isn't surprised. This is the same as the eigenvector we got before. This isn't surprising, but what we're interested in is um, what we have left, right? And that is minus one, zero, one, okay? Because I get a minus one, so if x2 is zero, which I actually wanna do, okay? Then, uh, right, I basically get x3 is always one, that's fine, and then x1 will be um, negative one. So I'm basically getting as my generalized eigenvector in this case, uh, 
this vector here. Okay. And what will always happen here, I don't want to get into why that happens because that's really too much theory for, for today anyways. Um, this will be linearly independent to the two given eigenvectors that we already had. So if I use as my matrix P, okay, and this is sort of the upshot of all this longish explanation. If I use as my matrix P, the one that contains the two eigenvectors that we had, and the generalized eigenvector that we found. And I hope the process of finding this is making sense. So again, uh, this is a, ch a checkable problem, as we will see in a minute, okay? Then um, what we get, so if you then look at P inverse AP, okay? So if you take the inverse of that matrix multiplied by the original given three by three matrix and multiply that once again by P, you get this pattern here. So this, what I've written so far, should be clear because these are simply, right, because these columns simply correspond to the eigenvectors of one and negative two. But then what you get in the third row is this, okay? So this one here, right, so this is again negative two. That's not a coincidence. That's again the eigenvalue with multiplicity two. But this one here sort of makes, right? If this were a zero, the matrix would be a diagonalizable, but we saw that can't be the case. But having this one here means that that matrix is almost diagonalizable, okay? So this kind of takes this whole business of, right, finding eigenvectors one step further by finding generalized eigenvectors. Um, again, um, the, apologize for the lecture running really long, which it really probably is now. Um, but it's something that's, I think, important to understand both from a the theoretical point of view, but also at some point, if you're taking uh, differential equations, it'll basically also help us solve differential equations, linear differential equations, and we will call them then. Okay, so that's all I have for this section. Thanks for your time, and uh, see you in the next video. Thank you.